Good afternoon. I'm Alex Trianis, Dean of the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Distinguished Speaker Series in which we discuss today's most compelling business challenges with most accomplished um, business professionals. Today, we're very pleased to have with us Wanya Lucas, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Crown Media Family Networks, which is a division of Hallmark Cards Incorporated. In her role, Wanya oversees the company's portfolio of entertainment brands, including the Hallmark Channel, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, and Hallmark Drama, as well as a subscription video on demand service, Hallmark Movies Now, and the publishing division, Hallmark Publishing. Prior to joining Crown Media in 2020, Wanya was president and chief executive officer for Public Broadcasting Atlanta, where she oversaw Atlanta's NPR and PBS stations. Previously, she was president and chief executive officer of TV One, where she became the second African-American woman to hold the president and, and CEO role at a cable television network. Prior to joining TV One, Wanya held several positions at Discovery Communications, including Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Discovery Channel and Science Channel, and Global Chief Marketing Officer, which entailed oversight of marketing in 210 countries and over 130 networks. And before her time at Discovery Communications, Wanya held executive leadership positions at the Weather Channel, Turner Broadcasting System, and its family of networks. She also spent several years in various brand management roles for Coca-Cola and for Clorox. So welcome, Wanya. It is uh, simply a delight to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you, Alex. So happy to be here. Well, I will start us off with a few questions, but we're also um, anxious to hear from our audience members as well. So just to... Uh, let our audience know that you can submit your questions using the Q&A button in Zoom at, at the bottom of your screen, and you can do so at any point. And we'll uh, take those questions after uh, some, some of the uh, introductory ones that I'll throw out. So um, as I noted in the introduction, um, Wanya, you led Crown Media, which includes the Hallmark Channel family of networks. And Hallmark is obviously a very well-known and well-established uh, brand. So I was hoping you could share with us uh, some of the advantages, but also maybe some of the challenges of being rooted in a legacy brand. Well, thank you, Alex. So first and foremost, I, I consider it to be, you know, truly extraordinary to work on a brand like Hallmark, which I had a great affinity toward as a child, which is one of the advantages. When you have a well-established brand, usually um, there is acknowledgement of that brand and therefore there are certain brand attributes that have already been seeded with the consumer. And so for with the Hallmark brand, which is about 111 years old, um, many of the attributes that are associated with the Hallmark brand include things such as trust. Um, it is also a place where you celebrate the best moments of life. So there's an essential um, connectivity throughout your entire life that's associated with this brand. It has a strong emotional core. It is about love. It is about happiness and joy. And even times that are more difficult, it is about empowering and uplifting people at, their, at the darkest times in their life as well. So it has this emotional range, which works really well for television. Um, and the last thing I would say is that it's distinctive. All of those things, trust, a strong emotional core, um, being distinctive, really important in a very crowded media space. In terms of some of the disadvantages, some of them include, you know, if you've tried the product, you may not, may or may not, um, you may have rejected the product and decided you wanted to, to go to another product. Um, there's price associated with, with uh, this consumer product. Um, there's also availability. So there are a lot of, I would say, retail issues that are associated with the Hallmark brand that um, aren't necessarily disadvantages, but those perceptions, um, that connection to the brand, both the advantages and disadvantages translate when people think about the Hallmark Channel brand as well. So, but I would take all the advantages over the disadvantages every day of the week. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, so so sticking on on this theme, I mean, you've you've as I mentioned in my introduction, you've worked with some of the most recognizable brands in the in the world, not only Hallmark but also Discovery and Turner and Coca Cola and Clorox. So, 
with a well-established brand, and, and as you mentioned, with a lot of great advantages, how do you maintain brand relevance as the marketplace um, is evolving? And so um, with that comes obviously some opportunities. One would hope to expand the brand identity. So maybe you could share with us some of what you're doing uh, with, with the Hallmark brand. Sure. Well, I will start by saying my foundation for approaching a media brand comes from brand management. And it was the smartest advice I ever got coming out of business school when I was looking at a lot of different opportunities. But someone said, come to Clorox, learn brand management because you can leverage it in any field you choose to go into. So when I entered the business working at Turner Broadcasting, my lens that I looked through um, at our brands and I was working on TNT was through the consumer lens. And every brand that I've worked on in media has been in some state of transformation, but all, all sort of revolving around the consumer. So I leverage my brand management um, experience by first truly understanding the consumer, where are they now, what are their wants, needs, and desires as it relates to the brand, and how do we develop how do we move from where we are today and leverage the things that are positive about the brand? We're talking about positives, the advantages, disadvantages. And then what are those needs, wants, and desires that we can incorporate into the brand? So I use, I go into every brand. I just did this for Hallmark. I do, um, we do a lot of in consumer insight groups, qualitative. This time we did them based on generation, um, which I'd not done before, um, but also race and ethnicity and really trying to find points of connectivity between each of those groups and our Hallmark Channel brand. But I did the same thing at TNT and CNN. We would do qualitative groups, but then also a psychographic segmentation group to understand who's that target, that core audience, but who are the opportunity audiences as well. And so by understanding and leaning into the consumer where they are now, but where they want to be, where, what are our aspirations and how can we get to that aspirational brand place, um, we're able to evolve the brands. And so I've seen that at CNN, um, CNN was the world's news leader. And we had this upstart called MSNBC that really was taking, looking at the news beyond sort of this global footprint, um, but really more storytelling, I would say, versus reporting. And then Fox News came on the on the horizon. And I will tell you, I was the one who'd have to go up to our senior leaders and I'm like probably the most junior person in the room and saying, this is a really, this is something we should watch. It is offering something that's very different to consumers than we do. And it's something that they resonate with. And we heard that in groups. So looking through the consumer lens is a way for us to understand how to maintain brand relevance over, I think, through the dawn of time, you just have to consistently touch base with your consumers and understand where they are and meet them there. So to that point, it, it is both sort of what they're looking for, what the expectations are in terms of um, content, if you like, but there's also the, the way in which now audiences are consuming entertainment, which is, um, I'm sure, a huge disruptive uh, force. So how do you distinguish and amplify your entertainment or network brand from the competition in this in this uh, market that is uh, changing rapidly. Yeah, I think, you know, I was in public media, as you mentioned, and coming back into this media space, the for-profit media space, I was startled by how, by the, line, the decline in linear television and how precipitous it was, or it is. Um, and mostly from young, the younger demographic. Um, so one of the things that we have is we are, um, we are um, solidly, um, I would say, um, an older demographic. And so we don't see the decline in linear moving as quickly as we have seen in, um, other, at other networks. Um, that being said, again, meeting the consumer where they are, we do see a tremendous opportunity on the streaming side. Um, I look at Disney as an example because Disney is also based on a traditional consumer brand that has been translated into a media brand. And I look at Disney Plus and they've got all their brands that are really prominently um, um, available and displayed. It's everything from Pixar to Marvel and Star Wars and Nat Geo. And if I look at our Hallmark portfolio, um, we also have brands that have been in existence for many, longer than many of their brands that have brand affinity with a consumer base, everything from Crayola to, um, we also have Dayspring, which is a faith-based brand. There are brands within the Hallmark portfolio like Mahogany, which targets African-American women. 
And that brand in particular is really important because African-American women watch 57% more television than any other demographic. So just like Disney, we are leaning into the intellectual property of our parent brand of Hallmark. And we will have a streaming service at some point that will absolutely speak to all of those different brands, represent those brands, but speak to those different audiences as well. Great. Well, I, I, we're starting to get a couple of questions come in and, and one of them I'll hold for a little bit later, but the other one you're going to have to help me with here because I, though I am a, a Hallmark viewer, I am not um, familiar with Mystery 101. And so this is a fan question. Will we see <laughs> one more Mystery 101? Love, Graham, Amy, and Travis. So tell me what I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so, so I'm going to start by saying thank you for the question. Um, the thing that's unique and distinctive about this brand than any other one I've ever worked on, and now it's akin to sports, we have fans. We really do. They're not viewers. They are fans. So I get questions like that all the time you know, about specific programming um, streams that we, we actually have, strands that we have. So Mystery 101 it airs on our Hallmark Movies and Mysteries Network, which is the secondary network. But honestly, it beats networks like Bravo and um, sometimes will beat Discovery, but they beat, it punches way above its weight. Um, primarily Mysteries, the movies, the, 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 type, the name of the network is pretty literal, Movies and Mysteries. So Mystery 101 is one of our, our movie strands. We are looking at how do we evolve our mystery content um, we still think that it's really viable. It's sticky. Once you get people hooked into the series of movies, then they come back over and over again. There is a series of movies um, called Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. And there's a group, they call themselves the Postables. And they write me all the time. Uh, the people for When Calls the Heart, um, which is on the Hallmark Channel, uh, the Hardies, they, they write me all the time. So lots of fans of Mystery 101, um, but TBD. Awesome. <laughs> um, well, there's also a question um, about a day spring that you just mentioned, um, but I think it's, it's specifically how, how would one connect to, to day spring uh, for Christian film submission? So this is somebody who's in the oh. business, I guess, who's interested, but maybe uh, we can follow up with that later unless you got a quick comment on that. Yeah, I would just say we can definitely follow up later, but what I would say is we just announced it today. So it is really hot off the presses. It's the first time I've talked about it publicly, but I, I, I love the Dayspring brand um, because if you spend time on their website and we spend time in Solemn Springs, Arkansas, where they're based, um, it, it, it pitches a big tent as well. Um, it really does. They have a very, um, I would say a more, a, a, they have a they have a brand extension targeted to a younger demographic called Encourage, which is very faith based um, as the Dayspring brand is as well. But the tone is a little different, um, and we are looking at everything from movies, series, and certainly podcasts. I think it's a brand that has uh, lots of legs and opportunity. So more to come. Yeah, that's very exciting. Well, um, we're talking about the brand of, of um, the overall brand of the companies and Hallmark in particular, obviously. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit to talking about, um, about personal brands and mm -hmm. what, um, you know, as a leader and a marketer, and you've talked about how valuable it was and how, um, how transferable the skills are learning about marketing and brands. Um, how should we manage our own personal brand? Are there ways to improve uh, personal brand and what should people look out for? Any, any good advice for our audience? Yeah, I, I approach personal brands like I do, you know, traditional brands. And, um, and I would say, let me just give you a story how I approach it with my kids. They hate the story, but when they went into middle school where you really do have to redefine yourself, <laughs> redefine yourself. Um, I would say to them, what is your unique, what's unique about you? What's different about you than everybody else? And that is your unique selling proposition, right? And I think for me, my unique selling proposition has always been that I'm left and right brain. I am, you know, analytical, which is why I was an engineer, but I'm also very creative. I went to a high school performing arts and I would lean into that distinction a lot. I still do today. So what makes you different than anybody else? And, and, and try trying to find that thing that is really valued, um, I think is important. And then I think also in terms of personal branding, it gets to brand differentiation when I talk about what's distinctive about you. 
Um, what is valued? I'll, I'll give an example. My first job out of college, I was a negotiations engineer. I was not the smartest person in the room by far. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I figured it out quickly. And I and what was valued by our salespeople was um, they wanted fast quotes, right? They wanted you to look at the the engineering, you know, skip. Sketch, um, sketch and try to figure out what products were needed and how do you price them and get it to them quickly. And I became the fastest. So understanding what can, how can you differentiate yourself by having a brand value or attribute that is actually valued by others and needed, I think is also important. But also I think at the end of the day, it's being authentic and true to who you are. Um, I'm not, I've always told people I've never tried to be anybody, but but me. And I think that we all bring something unique and distinctive to the party. And so just being being confident in who you are and what you bring to the party is important. And, and how just um, thinking about sort of the, your whole authentic um, self, uh, how how is your identity also impacted your leadership style? And, and particularly, I think when we discuss this, we think a lot about challenges that that women in the executive uh, suite face and i'm just kind of curious how, how you've addressed some of those issues along the way yeah i think you know so for me um i i i look at leadership very through a very different lens and that's i have to think of talk a little bit about how i grew up so my i grew up in a base in a sports family a baseball family so i learned how to win and how to lose and my uncle was Hank Aaron, and I had an opportunity to watch him lead in a very quiet way with humility and grace. And so I inherently adopted some of his attributes as a leader. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't put all this together when I was growing up. I just did in retrospect. Um, you know, my father was the first African-American um, General, black general manager in baseball. And I watched him lead with power and authority, but in a very kind and generous way. And so I learned how to operate and differentiate myself, but also make sure that I was seen and heard, which a lot of times women aren't. And a lot of times people of color aren't. Um, I made sure I was seen and heard, but done in a way that was, um, inviting and warm and, and kind, because I think ultimately, again, those are the things that I learned from my family, from great leaders who were authentically themselves. That's wonderful. And as a quick uh, personal side note, my uh, next door neighbor, um, their son is named Aaron. Uh, oh. <laughs> such, such big fans of him. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he truly was um, an incredible and distinctive um, individual. Um, so maybe we could we could um, talk a little bit more about sort of what Crown Media is doing um, in this space of DIB and, and thinking about sort of inclusion and belonging um, at all levels within the organizations. Could you share a little bit with us about some of the initiatives that you all have underway? Sure. I mean, first of all, I go back to you know the the parent brand of Hallmark, which has always been inherently inclusive. You know, I mentioned mahogany. Um, there's also a Spanish language brand called Vita. There's also an LGBTQ brand. Um, there's also, you know, there's a, there's, um, a, a, there's, there are two different religious brands. I mentioned Dayspring, but there's also a Tree of Life, which is their Jewish brand, Jewish faith brand. And so our, what a gift, right? To be able to have an, a brand that's associated with so many different groups and different types of people in different types of situations. And so what we are doing at Crown Media is really leaning into that. We are leaning to the essence of our brand. And we have more authentic representation in our storytelling than we've ever had before. Um, I tell people all the time that, you know, people ask me, you know, what do women think or what do black people think this has happened in my career before? I'm like, I can't speak for everyone. Understanding the nuance in you know, the African-American culture, understanding nuance in white culture, right? You know, let's have people who are Italian and Greek and bring those forth in our storytelling. So we are looking at diversity and inclusion and equity in a very different way than we ever have before, but really leaning into the parent brand. Um, I would say in terms of our employees, I think that's one of the things I was most impressed with. I've been at Crown Media for about a year and eight months. 
But our employee resource council is doing so much to help us from an employee base understand the sense of belonging. All the things I've mentioned before and all the things that I think a lot of people are doing, but really also like the sense of belonging. What does it mean to, to belong to, to feel like you belong in an organization? I think for us, because our brand is about the transformative power of love and all different types of love, whether it's sisterhood, whether it's family, whether it's romantic love, you know, we are a place that is kind and generous. And that gives people understanding the core and root of our brand gives them a sense of belonging because they have opted in because they want to be part of that environment. Um, we celebrate difference in many ways. We do town halls, we go into the community. Um, I, I am, again, all employee led. I'm incredibly proud of what our team is doing and what they have done. So a couple of follow up questions, one from an audience uh, member, which um, starts off uh, very beautifully by saying, you are amazing and inspirational. Um, <laughs> So um, how, how do you uplift and encourage those coming behind you? You've, you've talked a little bit about it and clearly through uh, what, what you model in terms of your behavior and, and one, one can easily sense the kindness and love coming out um, the way you speak. Um, but, but anything else that you've done in your career to, to sort of lift other folks up? Yeah, I will start by, I, I had no idea I was doing this, but when I was a Turner, um, I had access to like the most senior women because my mother worked there. She was the VP of community affairs and she knew everyone. And so I would just ask people to lunch and I realized I had privilege and I wanted to share these women and my access with others in the company. And I, with another colleague started something called Turner Women Today, which was an affinity group. We didn't use that term, but that's what it was. And it was in existence until they sold to Warner Media. It was in existence after that. I don't know if it still is after Discovery, but the fact that we wanted to bring together senior level women and give them um, exposure um, to amazing women in different levels, director level and above, I think it was in the company. And we would set up individual tables and do small table talks so that people could have access and really be seen and heard by them. And um, so I'm pretty proud of that. I really am. I, 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 I'm proud of that. But also, I've had the ability to mentor a lot of people that I've worked with, um, Kira Hannon, and, and uh, you know, I've mentored her, but I also look at it as, you know, she's mentored me. You know, everyone I mentor, I get so much back from them and I learn so much. So it is mutually beneficial. So I think that taking the time to really um, talk to people, share your life and experiences with people is really important. Understand what they want in their careers and and help help them navigate it. That's what I enjoy most about the job, quite honestly, is doing that everywhere I've been. And I have a group of people that have risen up through the ranks that are just doing extraordinary things that just makes me proud every day. Well, and another way that, that you have a position that allows you to, um, to leverage and have a huge impact is, is uh, producing content as well and, and directing uh, the portfolio of content. So there's a question here, um, what, are, what are some of the actions that you've taken to bring in greater representation in the content the Crown Media is producing? Yeah, it's a great question. And I just presented to the board a couple of months ago. And so I'll give you three. Well, I'll give you high level answer. We're bringing in more writers and directors and producers. So we've expanded. We used to work with a narrow group of people. Um, and it's a machine. We do 100 movies a year. That I mean, that's astonishing, honestly. Um, and so we've we've diversified the pool of creatives, both behind the scenes and also in, in behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, we are, but we're not just, you know, trying to take diverse people and put them in quite honestly, like a white movie. What we're doing is trying to be a lot more authentic. And I'll give, for the board, I gave three good examples. One example was a conversation in a movie called Christmas in Harmony, um, where a little girl, she's biracial, is having a conversation with her grandmother who's African-American and she's got really curly hair and she's a violinist. And she tells her grandmother, I have to wear my hair back, slick back because it's unprofessional to wear it like it is. 
And her grandmother tells her that, you know, you can wear box braids, you can wear, you know, this type of braid, you can do, the, you know, all these things with your hair because you're beautiful no matter what. That conversation takes place in every Black household, every Black household with girls. And so that was such an authentic moment. And Twitter just lit up because it was, I see you. Another example, when I took the job, a friend of mine who's Jewish said, can we have a Hanukkah movie that has Hanukkah in the title that's about Hanukkah, not about Christmas? And I didn't know what he was talking about. But then when I looked at the content, he was right. So this year we had a movie and it had Hanukkah in the title. We had part of a ceremony, this Hanukkah ceremony that was, was um, on the, in the film. And it was authentic and it was very representative of the Jewish faith during Hanukkah and it wasn't about Christmas. Um, so those are two really good examples. And then I think what we're doing in the LGBTQ space as well by having same sex couples who are um, in love and showing that aspect of love as well. And so those are examples that we used um, and how normalized it was in that family. Um, in this movie. And so we use those three examples to share with the board that it's not just about representation, it's about authentic storytelling as we are representing others. Yeah. And in fact, a, a question came in as you were saying that, um, which maybe um, is directly related, but I'll read it just in case there's anything else you want to mention. It says, what, what is Hallmark currently trending to broaden the concept of love? Oh. Well, I think um, a couple, a lot. So um, we look at love in a lot of different ways. Um, we look at love between different types of people, right? So that's one way. We look at love um, in terms of different situations. Like when I was interviewing, a lot of the movies are the same. <laughs> a lot of them are the same. And so we want, you know, and, and it's, listen, at the end of the day, our movies are always going to be joyous and happy. That's why people watch us. It gives them joy. And, but there's a, a road we take sometimes to get to love and it's not always easy. And so you'll see that more of that type of dramatic storytelling um, on HMM versus Hallmark Channel for a number of reasons. We're also looking at, um, I mentioned mahogany content was the first translation of a um, Hallmark brand, card brand that we've done in a long time since the Hallmark channel, quite honestly. And we just wrapped up our first movie called Unthinkably Good Things. It is about sisterhood at its core, but it is about sisterhood, three black women who are in Italy. One of them is teaching in Italy. And, um, and they have different um, circumstances in terms of their love interest. And, but at its core, it's about sisterhood. So when we think about expanding beyond, you know, the people that we put in and the types of stories, the authentic stories and representation, we also think about sisterhood, we think about family, we think about brotherhood, we think about um, any way that we can express love we want to show in our movies and that's our that's how we will broaden our aperture well that's great to hear and and um people are actively seeking this out right now of all of all times as well with everything going on um so it's wonderful to hear that there's more and more content being developed and, and there's a, another question about content um how do you get feedback from your diverse audiences to make sure the content is accomplishing what you want it to Great question. Well, the best feedback is when you look at the ratings. <laughs> That's just like, it's very telling. And one of the things, I'll give an example with um, African-American representation. Uh, African-American women represent about 4% of our audience. During Christmas, that increases. But when we put on movies that have two African-American leads, we, can, we went up as high as 40%. And keep in mind, African-American women watch 57% more television. So if you can attract that demographic, it will lower our median age, but also attract a larger audience. Um, but we also do, we do a lot of, again, consumer insight work. We do focus groups to get it right. And I think once we get it right, then our, our producers, our production team, they understand the nuance I'm talking about. Like when I, I can say as a black woman, yeah, that happens in every black household, but everybody doesn't know that, right? And the majority of our producers are not African-American women. So I always tell people, you are not the target audience. 
So we go in and we get uh, insights from generationally, again, generationally, what do people, how, what does love look like generationally, but also in terms of race and ethnicity. And we'll do groups on day spring um, as well. So consumer research. A lot of consumer research. And, and um, there's a, another question here. So not, not so much about the, the diversity um, or the new content, but how do you maintain quality standards when creating such a quantity and variety of content? And maybe you could also help define in, in, for your industry what, what quality standards really, um, how you do measure it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> such, a, such a tough question because quality is in the you know, hands of the holder. You know, it really is. I mean, I look at, for us, quality means um, it is family friendly to some extent, right? And our brand is, and that's why we can't, it, we're never gonna go dark, right? There are brands, our, there's some competitors that make a whole lot of money and they have great ratings really in the darkness. I helped launch Investigation Discovery, one of my favorite brands. They live in the darkness. So quality for us is making sure that we are true to our stories, that we are living true to our brand and that we are representing um, content that the entire family can watch. And that's just not the case um, on linear television, at least for most networks. Um, great. And, and there's a couple of questions regarding sort of the, the creation of, of content. Um, one of them is um, back to your earlier um, question of, of having sort of a more um, diverse um, creators of content. So um, a question about, can you explain a way for, um, forward for a female director? And we know that there are few, uh, too few female directors. Uh, so that's one question. The other question, just to throw these two together is um, regarding uh, sort of, we were talking about this uh, prior to going live about supply chain disruptions and what that really means in your business about mm -hmm. sort of being able to access the talent uh, that you need. So I thought maybe maybe those two could go together that there actually may be a, a supply sure. of content uh, of, of providers that we're not fully uh, capitalizing on. Yeah, I mean, I would say they're not nearly enough female directors, especially um, when it comes to, um, to, to, to television, I think movies, well, television or movies. Um, one of the things that we're working on, but we haven't fully um, developed is a, to develop a pipeline, a program to develop a pipeline for female directors is something that we're talking about. Um, they exist, I'm actually on the Sundance board and what Sundance does, they have a collab and they do a lot of work with both people of color and women to actually bring them along, train them for, for feature films or documentaries is what they primarily focus on. So there are pockets of places in the entertainment space that are focused on female directors in particular and writers. Um, but it is something that we're thinking about just because of the volume, as you mentioned. So we have something in the works that I will be able to talk about down the road, but we're working on it. Um, in terms of, of supply chain, I mentioned you know, Disney Plus and all the streaming services have changed the game as it relates to um, availability of writers, directors, producers, um, e even just content stories that will be translated. And so um, that has caused scarcity in the market, quite frankly. And, and the other, because there is scarcity in the market, we have to move much more quickly once we decide that we're actually going to, to green light a, a movie, because if we don't, someone will just, they'll, they'll go to the next person. So there is a, a war on talent in the media space right now. And many people, one of our advantages is because of our brand, many people want to be associated with the Hallmark Channel movie. It's just kind of like one of those staples, one of those stamps of approval. So that's really good for us. Great, and, and another question sort of about um, the variety of content um, with platforms like TikTok playing a huge role in how people are consuming media. Are you adapting the length of movies or using short form content to promote the Hallmark brand? Yeah, um, I, well, not for TikTok, but there's a whole TikTok strand on Hallmark Channel. It's pretty funny, pretty spoof, it's pretty funny. Um, 
But for us, I think when we look at the streaming service, the streaming business, I see short form content playing a big role there, um, as it does in, in Disney and others. Um, it's just an opportunity for us to test um, and refine before making big commitments at different points in time. But also, it's just a way to, you know, you need a lot of content on the streaming service. And so we're going to do both long form and short form. Great, great. Well, I, I want to take us back to talking a, a little bit uh, more about you and, and, and your life. And you've already shared some of that with us, which I appreciate. Um, a question here actually um, is going to take us back to our childhoods. Um, so first of all, um, congratulations on winning the inaugural Power of Play Award through the Children's Museum of Atlanta. So somebody uh, duly noted that. And um, given your, your comments earlier about being sort of a, a serial uh, daydreamer as a child, how would you encourage people, children of all ages, I love that, to fit more uh, space into busy lives for more play? Uh. What a great question. Well, I have been on the Children's Museum board for 22 years <laughs> when I had children. Um, and it's really important to me. I think, you know, when I mentioned Crayola and we're working on Crayola, it's, it's because I do think about this space. I think, um, I, th I think it's important for parents and anyone who has children in their lives to do things that spark their imagination. And I'll give you an example of things that I have done and I continue to do whenever I'm around young people, because um, it's more than taking them to, a, I, I think it's important to take them to a muse museums and expose them to different things and different people. But I believe in, you know, in play at home in everything you do. And so I would create, I went to a school performing arts, I would create characters with my kids and we would do role play. Neither of them would ever go into to a school performing arts, but <laughs> but it just, you know, we would start these storylines with each other. When, when I read to them, I would ask them questions. What do you, where do you think this story is going and why? And just getting them to think beyond um, their limits, their natural limits, and to create and ideate. They didn't know they were doing that, but that's what I would get them to do. And I think, you know, my mom was a teacher for many years and I watched her um, expand minds. It's just the best way to put it. And she would do it. She was a history teacher and she would have living history. It's probably why I love plays, living history. So just engaging children and, and, um, and pe young people in your life and asking them questions and asking them to ideate and develop. It could be a product, it could be a play, it could be a lot of different things. But I think that imagination, the beginning, the ability to dream and believe and um, it starts really early and just keeping that alive. That's great. And, and when you, when I put together all the, all the pieces um, that you've shared with us in terms of you know, the sports background, the performing arts, then the, then the STEM background as an, as an engineer, and then you got your, um, your MBA at Wharton. So tell us a little bit, because we're kind of interested in business schools here. <laughs> what, what, is the, um, what is the value add then uh, with all the other backgrounds you had? Um, what did you get out of your business degree that, uh, that has lived with you to this day? Yeah, I loved, I loved um, being in business school. I wish I could go back. My daughter just finished business school. Um, you know what I got out of it most? It's like all the, you know, you get all the academics and definitely not the same type of pressure that I had in engineering, um, which, you know, that wasn't much fun a lot of the time, but I just had fun learning. Like I understood the phrase, the joy of learning. <laughs> You know, I went in business school and a lot of that learning, as you all know, takes place in the classroom and it really takes place with the interactions with your classmates and what you learn from them and their life experiences and their whatever their academic background is. I think the thing that stays with me most beyond the academic piece, because that kind of wanes over time when you get into a specific job. But for me, it's the friendships. I, I am still close to so many of my Wharton friends. I was the EV, I was the executive vice president, one of the one of two. <laughs> I was very involved. I was in our follies. So I was really involved with a lot of different groups, our Black Student Association. I was really involved. And the people in my life that still are there 30 years later, it's just amazing to me. I have a whole West Coast 
Bay Area crew. Um, it's just great. That's what you get out of it. It really is. Well, I, and I, I totally agree. And that's one of the, the great things I always um, mention to students uh, in the orientation piece is just um, part, part of what we try to do in business school schools is bring together people from all sorts of backgrounds and interest areas. And it just creates such a, an amazing uh, group that, um, as you said, you can be connected to for the rest of your life. And, and in terms of the joy of learning, I think, I think we get that joy when we also hit the sweet spot in our lives, right? Where we're learning something about what we really uh, maybe are meant to do. And I think that um, I'm sure was the case for you. So maybe um, just a couple of questions about, about leadership, um, which, which clearly is, is your, the sweet spot that you uh, discovered. So um, one question we have here is with love at the heart of Crown Media, mm -hmm. how much do your emotions play a role in your choice choices as a leader? So do you see leading with vulnerability? Um, and you talked before about authenticity as, as an advantage. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, for me as a leader, um, you know, probably again, probably because of my theater background, I never would have said I lead with vulnerability. I wouldn't have used that phrase, but I always have. And one of the things I try to do is be accessible as a leader. And whether, you know, my whole job has been <laughs> during a pandemic. So <laughs> access is a little different than <laughs> if you're a person. It's very odd and strange to start a job this way. I have to meet people in person all over again. Um, but I do touch and base with Wanya all the time. And, you know, anybody can come and they can ask me anything. And it just becomes, I've, what I've found is that it's become a conversation. Um, it's not about me and what I have to say. It's about the people in the room. And it becomes a safe place for everyone to show vulnerability, for everyone to share their truth. And I think that's important because I have seen, and I have been guilty of this, quite honestly, at different points in time, but I've seen leaders who get out of touch sometimes. You know, it's just so about the business metrics and, you know, it's this is a highly competitive field. My old boss used to say competition changes every second and it's true. And so it's a reminder that back to my Wharton sort of what's important, what's important is the people you work with, right? And how you understand what they want out of their careers and helping them and giving them a very safe place to be their authentic self and to live the brand that we represent internally. Which, which takes us to a question that, that everybody is talking about uh, these days, whether they call it the great resignation or whatever they whatever term, um, just this, this issue of in particular, you know, even before COVID hit, where, where um, sort of attrition at, at all companies was on, on the rise, right? And, and, and a sense of sort of a less of a commitment maybe to, to a company. Um, and so now we've definitely seen that sort of um, addressed in the context of, of, of COVID and people and, and the shortage of um, workers that, that people are looking for the next great opportunity. So the, the question is, you know, all around culture, right, is how do you build a culture where people really want to stay? How do you, as you, as you mentioned, you started a couple of years ago, how do you build a culture where somebody coming and working um, primarily remotely feels included? So I'd um, love to hear your thoughts about what you're doing to kind of keep a, a strong culture. Yeah, I would say that we are, it's, it's work in progress, right? Because there's been so much change and the fact that we aren't, we are a collaborative business and the fact that we are not yet in the office and it's hard to collaborate that way. Um, but I do think it starts by um, listening. So for me, I talk about touching base with Wanya, but I also meet with every employee. I met with everyone in the company when I first started and I asked them a few questions like, you know, tell me who you are, where you're from, what do you do? Basic, but tell me your hopes, dreams and aspirations. And the reason I did, and the reason I do that is because I think it's important to have, in, especially in our business, a culture where everyone can contribute, right? It's not about what you do in this. Everyone can contribute. We make movies. It's not rocket science, right? It's not like, you know, we're making movies. It's about stories. So ensuring that everyone feels that they can contribute beyond what their job is, I think it's important. Um, 
because we all touch it in some way. Um, I think a culture of inclusion was already in the works when I got there because of the time that I joined. It was right after, you know, it was it was that summer of social justice, civil unrest, racial unrest, and joining um, the company at that time. They were already. Um, I would say reckoning with it and understanding and unpacking it and trying to figure out what does that mean for us in our workforce and how we how we live in our world. Um, and so really leaning into continuing to lean into that and empowering people. Um, I talked about our ERC that's really important So our culture of um, inclusion and the ability to speak up which they, they didn't really have quite honestly. And then I would also say that, you know, we are still, we've got to try to figure out what the culture looks like when we come back. There's just been so much change. Um, our business has changed, people have changed, um, what people may want in their lives have changed. And so that's the work that we're doing right now is really trying to figure out what's the optimal culture as it relates to when we are actually and how we're actually physically in each other's presence. Yeah. But more work to be done there. For for all of us, for sure, and and I love I love your um, your question of you know what what are your aspirations that you ask your employees. I actually um, I was sharing um, a little th this morning with one of my colleagues is that uh, an alternative term to the great resignation is the great aspiration. Mm. And I that was really very interesting. Is that it's not that people are necessarily leaving um that that's kind of what's on their mind is how do i leave but it's rather you know, what am i aspiring to do that's 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 new and different and if we can find obviously internally in our organizations the way to match them to ask them that as you do and to try to uh, help to deliver on that promise then that um that will keep them in in our organizations so um, yeah. well, let me share one quick story so sure. i did that little process in public media and there was this one young lady right out of Emory, she was right out of undergrad. And she said, I, I don't have a, oh, I'd ask a fun fact. She's like, I, I don't have one. And someone said, tell Wanya what you do on the weekends. And she said, I investigate civil rights cold cases with my professor at Emory. Wow. And I said, you have the best fact in the building. We turned her fact, we went, I met her, her professor, he's the Pulitzer Prize winning author, he's the editor of the AJC. Um, started the journalism school and um, and we created our first podcast, which won a Peabody Award and and, um, and also a Human Justice Award. So mm -hmm. that's an example of how like a someone who has perceived like has nothing to offer, has everything to offer. That's the kind of culture that we want. Yeah, uh, what a great story. Uh, well, here's here's a light question. Uh, what are, what are the biggest decisions you've made since being CEO? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, the biggest decision, one of the biggest decisions is when to go back to the office, right? Um, that I'm, we, you know, we're in five different locations, people have different life circumstances. The world is different than it was pre pandemic. So we talk about it a lot. Like, how do we, how do we make sure that we are being true to each you know, constituency and also each office and each manager. So that is like, it's it's like a puzzle that you have to solve. Um, and we talk about it a lot. We still haven't, we probably come, we're probably coming back in September, but we haven't designed what that will look like. That's probably one of the biggest decisions that I'll make. Um, my team has been probably the other biggest decision. Um, I had to add some people on my team. Um, I have been incredibly fortunate to find the best in the business who, um, people, I always like to work with people I can learn from, and these people I highly respect and I can learn from. So I think that's also been, so those have been two big decisions, been people decisions, but also the office decision, which is a people decision. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, another um, question, if you could share any, um, I think there are a couple of similar questions. One called it failures, but um, somebody else is calling it early setbacks. <laughs> uh, that, that gave you uh, some lessons learned and 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 gave you an advantage uh, now as, as a leader. Oh, um, there are many. <laughs> there are many, but I will use I'll use CNN because um, I was the first head of marketing at CNN, and you know we were you know we were in um, we we're international and we were growing. We were the world's news leader. 
um, we were starting to launch some, you know, talent driven shows. And the first show that we were well, like the second show we launched was one with Paula Zahn. And, um, and, and the mistake that was made, and I take accountability is that um, we were launching the show, we were producing a promo very, very quickly. And um, I ha- I'd hired someone from entertainment to lead that group. And we had a snowstorm, so I didn't get to see the promo. We just talked about it and ele- we just talked about it. Anyway, it goes on the air. It's not quite what we talked about. <laughs> um, it, it sounds like, it's like who's smart and inquisitive and something else. And it, and it was a record scratch. It said Paul is on and a record scratch, Paul is on. Well, Fox News got a hold of it and said it was a zipper and it became what is now known as Zippergate. And my boss at the time was Walter Isaacson, brilliant man, great man. Um, and you know he and others wanted to fire the person who did it. And as a leader, I had to decide who, what am I made of, right? Did I make the mistake? No, but am I accountable? Yeah. So I remember going in that day and, and it was all over the New York Times. It was a very hot public mistake. And I said to everyone, I said, ultimate, I said, this is what happened. I'm held accountable. It's my department. Right? I'm held accountable. And um, because you know, it, was, it was a huge debacle. And I remember um, the CEO at the time, Jamie Kellner said, Wanya, nobody's getting fired. Um, over this, you know, we will, we will get through this. And I think what I learned from that mistake is, you know, my mom used to say, if you mess up, fess up. Like I knew that and doing that, but doing it on behalf of my team, because ultimately I am held accountable was really important. And I consider that a failure, but I also consider it a success. Thank you for, for sharing that, that story. And, and earlier you talked about um, how you enjoy uh, mentoring folks and, and all the folks that, that you've had an opportunity to serve as a mentor to. Um, there's a question about um, whether or not you've had a, a mentor or a coach that's helped guide you through um, uh, any, any setbacks or just in general throughout your career. Any, any folks that you look up to? You, met, you mentioned uh, Isaacson as one. Yeah. I've, I've just worked with some amazing people, um, oh, so many. Um, some of whom are not names that you know. I mean, I would say Ted Turner has been a mentor to me. Um, my father worked for him. And when um, my father died when I was 18, right before I went to college, and Ted helped put me through college and continued to be a mentor of mine. Um, not active. You kind of wanted to hide from him sometimes, but, <laughs> but, but he was helpful. Um, a lot of uh, the women I mentioned at Turner are mentors of mine. Terry McGurk, who runs the Braves, knew my father when he worked for the Braves. And he, I don't make a move without Terry. He has been incredibly helpful as a mentor to me. Um, a man named Decker Anstrom, who was on the who led the Weather Channel when Kira and I were there, but also was on the board at Comcast and Discovery, um, very well-respected mentor of mine. So I've just been really fortunate. I can, yeah, I've just been really fortunate to have many mentors. And, and in terms of uh, success as a leader, there's a question about, you know, beyond business metrics or mm-hmm. let's call them maybe financial metrics, how do you measure success as a leader? Oh, what a good question. Um, you know, I, I measure, like you can look at metrics like human resource metrics, but I don't look at that. I look at success as a leader, the number of people that I can help um, achieve their goals, their career goals. And that's why I take time to, I mean, I don't talk to everybody in the company every day, but that's why I take time to, to be accessible and to talk to people. And a lot of times I'm giving career advice uh, to people. So I think to, you know, to me, it's really important to, to reach back and teach um, others. Again, my mom was a teacher. So I think that by just being engaged and in touch, it's a way for me to do that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. A uh, couple of final questions I think we have time for. Um, this one just came in with, with love at the core of Hallmark's business. Are you working on projects or with organizations in the world to bring greater love? So I guess this is maybe beyond the content um, that you're that already is shaping that. Yeah, so we are in the process of developing. We've, we've always 
given back in the community, but we're in the process of developing a corporate social responsibility platform. Um, we just launched a new brand campaign and it's called Where Love Happens is our tagline. And our, our sort of umbrella tagline for our, our CSR um, initiatives will be um, Where Care Happens because Hallmark, the Hallmark brand is about putting care into the world. And one of the first things that we did is we went to, we have a Western called Wind Calls the Heart. And obviously we have horses in the Western. And one of the things that we did with the Wind Calls the Heart team is um, create an association with a relationship with um, a ranch that, that rehabilitates race horses. And so we have donated to them. We've gone and volunteered there and it's just the beginning. And so we're looking at finding ways to connect our brand with our care, the care that we, in terms of our, co co our corporate social responsibility. So more to come, that's just the first uh, thing that we've done. That's awesome. Well, here's, um, I, I won't ask you to pick your, your favorite daughter, but you are being asked if you have a favorite Hallmark movie. Um, wow. I, you know, I, I really, I have many, that's the problem. I have many favorite Hallmark movies. I think any Hallmark movie that ends with people being happy, um, is my favorite Hallmark Channel movie. It really is. I mean, I love the Christmas movies. One that I will tell you one I'm super excited about. Um, we have a movie coming up that's set in the 50s that's about Rockettes. So we partnered with the Rockettes and, um, and it's really about sisterhood at the end of the day. And I love that movie, movie because it's a period piece. Um, it has a diverse cast and it's, um, it's ultimately about sisterhood and people who are high achievers, but take the time to really um, form these uh, this bond, this sisterly bond, and these relationships that really are meaningful and matter. Um, so that that's one of my favorite movies that's coming up. Great. Well, thank you for giving us a preview that that's uh, on the horizon, and we'll look. We'll definitely look for that. Well, um, Wanya, I just I um, want to thank you so much for for your time, but really all of your insights and, and your inspiration. Um, uh, we we can tell the love and the kindness in in in, in how you. Uh, share uh, your stories, your your career journey with us, and clearly, it's um, you're, you're in a perfect place uh, as a CEO. <laughs> so, congratulations and um, best of luck as you all uh, navigate getting uh, folks uh, back into the office. But regardless, it sounds like uh, there's exciting things on the horizon. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Good luck to everyone out there, and enjoy. Continue to enjoy your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Wanya. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.